Hello everyone and welcome back to video number two of Grab to Light in which we're going to be looking at the morphology uh, of these animals. So let's start off by introducing the general elements of their morphology um, irrespective of the group to which any individual Grab to Light belongs. So the structure we see as fossil Grab to Light um, is used to house zooids. It's a thing called the tubarium. So this is the, the housing of the colony, and that was probably collagenous, so made of collagen like our, our, many of our connective tissues within the vertebrates. Although graptolites are abundant and important fossils in many early Paleozoic assemblages, it is notoriously difficult to discover what they're actually made of. And that's because most assemblages occur in black shales that have been either compacted or diagenetically altered, so they've been changed on their way to becoming a rock. Often they'll have been metamorphosed within or around orogenic belts, and that um, destroys organic materials such as collagen really quite quickly. It just changes them into, into carbon. So that limits what we can say about what they're made of. But if we look in detail at this tubarium, this colony housing, we can see, for example, that they have a growth pattern. It's made of half rings that meet in zigzag structures, most clearly visible in this diagram on the right. Each tubarium um, represents just one colony, which grew from a small cone called a cicula. So the cicula can be at the top, uh, as in this orientation here, or it can be at the bottom of the organism, depending on which particular group, group you're looking at. The colony comprises a series of branches. Um, that's true of uh, of all graptolite colonies, so that, that number of branches can be one. And these branches are called the stipes. These stipes may be isolated. They may, for example, dangle freely, or they can be linked together by lateral struts, as shown in this example on the top left here. And these are called decepaments. So similar to the, uh, the name that you have for, for cross bits in uh, corals, although not necessarily homologous with those, same word. If you look at the stipes in detail, what you see is a series of roughly cylindrical tubes in which our zooids lift. These are called thecae, so you can see examples both here on the left and here on the right. So this one's nicely labelled theca for you, so thecae is the plural of theca. So these thecae housed our individual zooids, the individual animals that make up the colony, and just FYI, these animals were genetically identical, so they are all um, genetically the same. There are two important divisions that we need to know about within the Graptolites. These are the dendroids and the Graptoloids, or dendroidia or Graptoloidia. So this does mean that occasionally we have um, dendroid Graptolites and uh, Graptoloid Graptolites. Bit of a mouthful, but just bear in mind that this is just a subdivision of the Graptolites as a whole. Um, the origins and the evolution of this group, uh, or of both these groups, are, are matters of current research. So the dendroidia is the older of these two main groupings. So these creatures appeared in the middle Cambrian and disappeared in the late Carboniferous. They are marked by having a tubarium, so this, this colony structure as a whole, that was multi-branched. It looks a bit like a bush, even though it's not related to a uh, plant, um, with its many stipes connected laterally by decepiments. So though, that phrase that we met uh, earlier in this video. These creatures um, have two types of theca of different sizes, called the autotheca and the bitheca. Those names aren't important, but just the fact that there are two types of theca within the dendroidia is useful to know. These, the group as a whole started as benthic, and indeed me, me, the majority of the members of this group are benthic, attached to the seafloor by a short stalk with a basal disc. Um, so that's an attachment disc. In the latest Cambrian, a few genera detached themselves from the seafloor and evolved into a planktonic or floating mode of life. Um, and so that's probably the origin of our graptoloid graptolites. The example of our dendroidia are shown on the right here, 
And these uh, show some, this shows some of the range of form within this group. Bear in mind that all our kind of erect growing forms attached to the seafloor apart from C, this creature in the mi middle here that was an encrusting form. But this, these two on the right are the kind of structures that I uh, associate with my typical member of the Dendroidia. If we move on to our other group, the Graptoloid tubarium, so this is our Graptoloid Graptolite, appears simpler than the Dendroid um, tubarium. It comprises an initial circular that's divided into um, different areas, but essentially that leads to a spine at its apex, which is a, often a long, thin structure and is called the nema. So you can see it um, labeled here. Our circular is down here on this creature and it's this, this uh, structure goes all the way up the back of this colony. I say back, that's not an anatomical description, just the left-hand side of this drawing. This uh, structure, the vagella, uh, projects below the circular aperture um, and it's only present in some species, it's not particularly important. The thecae grew out from the circular and subsequent thecae grew in sequence as the tuparium developed. So you've got theca being added as this thing grows. There are a wide range of forms in this group, as you can see from these images on the right hand side here. The taxonomy within the uh, graptoloids is based on the number of stipes, those branches of the, um, of the colony as a whole, their mutual attitudes, and the shape of the theca on them. So those are three things that are really useful in um, taking this, this really diverse group of creatures and, and adding some um, sensible organizations to them. So only some of this disparity is shown on the right hand side. So, so, so only some of the range of variation within the group. But you can see even within this limited um, collection, you've got everything from um, more than two through two to one stipe within these colonies. And some of them are even look coiled up. This actually makes a bit more sense when we put it into some evolutionary context. But in order to put these into that evolutionary context, we just need a tiny bit more terminology. So in Graptoloids, in fact, in one particular suborder, the uh, Dicograptids or Dicograptids, the stipes can take a number of different positions, all of which, of course, because this is paleontology, have their own name. So this group actually underwent a radiation in the Ordovician. And we have this variety of symmetric Graptolites um, with between eight and two stipes that appeared in relatively short succession after each other. We can uh, define that attitude, i.e. how the stipes are related to each other in space as um, pendant, so hanging downwards, declined, so actually starting to, to separate a tiny bit, as horizontal, does exactly what it says on the tin. There's an example of a horizontal spa species here. As reclined, this is the point at which the stipes have gone past the horizontal and have started um, moving upwards. Or scandent, where they actually meet back to back, as it were, and we start getting a single structure hanging downwards. So all of those different attitudes of the stipes exist in different species. Um, this diagram shows examples of those arrangements um, with example species of each. But as a general point with this diagram, what we're looking at is the evolution of the group roughly, there are obviously exceptions, but as we travel from the bottom to the top of the diagram, we're also traveling through the order vision in time. And that's because there's a really famous and well-studied evolutionary change within this group throughout the order vision that is associated with this, radi this radiation. So Tetragraptus, and this example on the far left here of this image that I am a source from the University of Cambridge was common in the late early Ordovician. And it typically had four stipes arranged either um, in horizontal pendant or reclined attitudes. It had simple overlapping theca. So we're looking at a kind of dangling form that's relatively simple. Around this time, we get um, a genus called Didymograptus appearing. So this is marked by a twin stipes, or otherwise known as biramus form, so only two stipes rather than more, um, which appeared uh, shortly afterwards. These stipes could be horizontal, horizontal pendant or reclined in their orientation, and again they had fairly simple thecae. 
But then we start seeing, as we move through the order vision, tags that are more horizontal in the arrangement of their stripes. So this example is Leptograptus here in the middle. We then have examples uh, start appearing like Decelograptus, which has a pair of stripes that adopted a reclined or sometimes called reflexed as here attitudes. Often the, the branches of these individuals were um, curved or even coiled. Atheke were characterized by more complex form than these simple forms I talked about earlier. They had, for example, extra extravagant sigmoidal shapes and incurved apertures, so the openings were very, very complex. By the middle order vision and through to the Silurian, we start seeing scandent forms where the Thike are on the outside of the cult colony appearing. So these are the examples shown on the right hand side here. Finally, by the Silurian, we start to see forms where one of those stipes has been lost. Then you get a thing uh, called a unicereal scandent form, such as monographs shown on the right here. So this one has Thike on both sides, this one's got Thike only on one side. These creatures are had either a straight, as seen here, or a curved tuberium, and a nema embedded in the dorsal wall that projected distally. So monograptids, uh, these creatures on the right hand side here, dominated Silurian graptolite faunas. And despite their, um, I guess, apparent simplicity, this group evolved a huge variety of forms. They're most easily recognized through their thecal shape and arrangement. The last graptolites, um, and indeed graptoloids, appeared during the early Devonian in China and Eurasia and North America in terms of new species that we see in the fossil record. But remember, there are arguments um, going on that some um, groups that are still alive today may actually be members of this group. If so, we've got this very long ghost range. This is a really distinctive and quite famous example of evolution in the fossil record that at a glance can often tell you roughly where you are in the Ordovician or the Silurian. An interesting question, which we may want to consider, is why is there this trend uh, towards the reduction in the number of stipes? It could be that the simpler stipe configuration was hydrodynamically more stable and better adapted to turbulence. That's one idea that has been published. It could be that it aided the motion of the graptolite through the water column when they were feeding. It could have been to prevent the interference between thecae on adjacent stipes, providing a simpler, more efficient colony structure. Or it could be a combination of any of these three things. We really don't know at the moment. So that's why this is a really interesting group to learn about, because there are lots of unanswered questions. I think it's safe to say that this is true also of the mode of life of these creatures. Um, it's far easier with dendroid raptolites, where they were either benthic, so we know they were attached and, and they, they lived on the seafloor, or the, the occasional, occasionally planktonic forms. The mode of life of graptoloids is more controversial. So there have been ideas published in the past that these creatures were attached to rocks or seaweed. This is what's shown on the diagram on the left of this slide here, is also my uh, title slide, and is now known to be, or widely believed to be incorrect. Um, researchers have rejected this idea because there is no evidence for attachment structures. As such, we now think that planktic graptoloids, so the graptoloidia, um, lived unattached in the oceans. We think they were actively moving through the water column, filtering water to gather food. It's now relatively widely accepted that these colonies could move both up and down in the water column as they so wished. Um, and it seems likely their distribution in the water column was based on their ecological needs, the water currents and temperature gradients. It could be that these are uh, these colonies were supported by fat and gas bubbles in their tissues, or by extensions to the nema, but we don't really know what gave them their buoyancy. We do think that during intervals of intense feeding, there was a, a reactive upward movement of the colony in the water column that could have occurred. So as all of those individuals are filtering water, it could have as a whole made the colony move up in the water column. It may be 
But um, multi-ramus colonies, those with multiple um, different branches, uh, may have rotated as shown on the right hand side here and thus acted as kind of sweep net feeders. So uh, things that fell through the water column, picking up uh, food as they went down. Um, but again, a lot of this conjecture. We think that food particles probably moved um, based on the currents of the individual zooids into a thing called the food basket, which was between the stipes. And this, the, uh, the kind of the beating of the ciliated zooids helped create the currents that allowed this. And then water was injected, ejected from the center of that basket. So it's a filter feeding type mode of life. All of the, putting all of this together, that paints a picture where we think the colony may have been able to move vertically into the nutrient rich photic zone at night. And when they were replete, when they'd fed, they could sink to positions lower in the water column where their specific gravity uh, matched that of the surrounding water. So we get this kind of picture of a diurnal cycle of these creatures. But there's a lot of um, speculation in there as well. So take it for what it's worth. That's a series of um, educated guesses rather than anything upon which we're certain. And with that, I will see you in the next video when we'll look at these things as fossils. See you soon.